the last session we spent quite some time focusing on three main pranayams, three main practices, Ujjayi, Brahmari and Nadi Shotnam. We spoke in fair detail about Nadi Shodnam with Vishnu Mudra, that is the use of hands. This session I wanted to explain to you the importance of shifting the breath from one side to the other, from left to right and right to left, and why we do this. This is a breathing rhythm that we all have. The yogis have studied the breath empirically. They were scientists and the body was their laboratory. Unlike modern scientists who perform experiments on external subjects, they have performed experiments on themselves. Through their studies, they discovered something very unusual, a pattern in the breathing. A pattern when they were not manipulating their breath, but a natural pattern. And the pattern was a change in the breath approximately every 90 to 120 minutes, so about one and a half to two hours, the breath shifts from one nostril to the other nostril. So at any given point of time, only one nostril is active. So right now, you can test, take your finger, put it in front of your nostril, and check which nostril is active. So some of you might find that your right nostril is more active. And some of you might find that your left nostril is more active. This was a quite an amazing discovery because this gave them the clue to how the personality, the mind, the body is set up. The entire nervous system is set up. It shifts at any given point of time. Your right brain <clears throat> is more alert. Then it shifts. The left brain is more alert. If your right nostril is active, that means your left brain is more active. If your left nostril is active, it means your right brain is active. It's crossed. It's a crossed. As we know from modern science, the right brain is more active, logical, dominant for most people. The left brain is more creative, it's very good at speech, languages, art, music, the softer skills. You might even call them the more feminine skills. The right brain has more masculine skills. So if this may sound now a little bit familiar, we are talking about the human brain, which itself is divided into two parts, right and left. And they seem to be like masculine and feminine. So all of us have a certain dominance. Very often we find that men are more right brain dominated and women may be left brain dominated. 
But there may be also differences where you have men who also are very, very creative and maybe left brain dominated. Or women who are very logical, scientific, have a very different kind of personality, a more dominant personality, and they may be right brain dominated. There is no prejudice in this. It's, it's neither is right nor wrong. It's merely a tendency that we have. However, there's a shift in breath all the time, which causes the shift also in our thinking processes, in the way we communicate, in the way we take in information and how we use this information. When the yogis studied this, they discovered that by understanding which nostril was more active and understanding which side of the, of the brain was more active, in effect, they discovered what qualities, what tendencies in them were, were more active. So what did they do? They said, when you want to do something creative, such as writing a scripture, then your left nostril should be more dominant. Sorry, your right nostril should be more dominant. When you do activities such as hard work in the fields, for example, or warfare, for example, then you want your right brain to be more active, which would be the left nostril. So in this manner, they were able to regulate their habits and keep them in sync with the breath. It's another way of saying they would go with the flow of nature. As one became more observant of the breath, they realized they can also change their breath flow. Which meant that what was an involuntary system could now become voluntary. And they did this using certain techniques. But most importantly, they found out about the nervous systems, the brains, the two brains, and they developed their own language for this. This language, scientific language, yogic language, they named the right brain Pingala and the left brain Ida, or the sympathetic system Pingala and the parasympathetic system, nervous system, Ida. We talk about Nadis, Ida and Pingala. Many of you have heard of these. And we turn this into something very esoteric. In reality, this is what it means. These are the dualities of our human body. What then is Sushumna? There is indeed the centralis canalis. When the breath flows equally from both nostrils, the mind experiences a certain calm. There is a sense of balancedness, a feeling of being completely balanced and at sync with nature. It's a point of transition when the breath shifts from the right nostril to the left nostril. That is a time of transition. Or when it shifts from the right nostril to the left nostril. This time of transition, it appears that the breath is flowing from both, from the left as well as the right. Which means 
both the brains are active, which means both the nervous systems are balanced, sympathetic as well as parasympathetic. And that we say is Sushumna. The energy is flowing through the central channel. This was the yogic science. Those people who did not understand the yogic science because it was forgotten for many centuries or because it was kept hidden only in certain lineages, handed down only from teacher to student, those who started reading, understanding things from a purely intellectual point of view, they read into these scriptures whatever they wanted to read into these scriptures. And when they did that, they did not understand the yogic science. When the British came to India and they read the tantric text, they said, oh, what a whole lot of rubbish this is. There is no such naris in the body. They cut open the human cadavers and they said, see, there is nothing like a ida and pingala. There's nothing like these lotuses and these chakras. They don't exist. And indeed, they do not exist at the level of the physical body. What they were talking about was the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. They had a far, far finer and subtler understanding into the human body, which was very practical. So emerged the Pranavadins. The Pranavadins were people who got very focused on the shifting of the breath. And so they became very particular. When they ate, they had to have a particular nostril open. When they slept, they had a particular nostril open. When they worked, there was a particular nostril that had to be open. And they started manipulating the flow of the breath in order to find that perfect moment to do whatever it was that they wanted to do. However, caution is advised in shifting the breath all the time and manipulating it in this manner because it can completely disturb the natural breath of the body. We do it during Nali Shodnam in a specific manner in order to open the Sushumna and not merely to have the right balance, you know, the right nostril or the left nostril opening according to what you wanted to do. That is a form of manipulation. So these cycles of left and right, male and female, they coincided with many other cycles. It's like the lunar cycle. These are all cycles of nature. The seasons, the solar cycles, is also a cycle. Day and night, setting of and rising of the sun, is a 24-hour cycle that we have. During the breathing cycle, we also experience, it's a bit like the tides, where there is ebb and there is tide. There's high tide and there's low tide. There's high tide and there's low tide. This is continuous movement. And the purpose of gaining mastery and flowing with these helped us be in sync with our, the, with our own body. When the yogis discovered that they have these rhythms, they started looking for ways to go deeper and go beyond these rhythms. Because these cycles, as you can well imagine, are 
keeping us grounded to the external world, to go beyond these rhythms of high tide and low tide, of left and right, of male and female, of sun and moon. To go beyond these dualities meant that the Sushumna should flow, to go to the center, the middle, the transition point. And so they scientifically studied how to go from the gross to the subtle, from the material energies to the finer energies, from the external to the internal, from movement to stillness. They discovered that there are not really compartments, but it's like a continuum. It's a flow. As this, they were able to maintain the Sushumna, they discovered this was a continuum, a flow. And that's what that flow looks like. You have the world outside and as the Sushumna opens, you go from the senses and the world outside to the body, flow to the breath, come to the mind. As you go deeper with the Sushumna, with the breath, you come to the active and eventually to the latent unconscious mind, which finally takes us to prana itself. And when you're established in it, to the center of consciousness. So this is how prana leads us to the deepest aspects of ourself. Often, if you do not study the subtleties of breath, we tend to think the body is separate from the breath, separate from the mind, that these are separate entities. With the subtle understanding, with the subtle observation, you begin to realize that these are not compartmentalized, that they flow into each other, that they are interwoven. We cannot separate them really. So the process in pranayam, which may begin purely at the level of breathing exercises, is to go inwards, gradually flowing inwards, and then also coming outwards back into the world. When the attention goes from body to the center of consciousness in this direction, it is known as Nivritti Mark. It is away from the world, it's a renunciation. When it goes from center of consciousness towards the world, it's called Pravritti Mark. That is the creation of the world. Our tradition is one of the unique traditions. We do both. And in doing both, we gain mastery into both. We become masters of the material universe as well as spiritual universe. We gain mastery into both vidyas. We learn to understand the rules of the external world and the rules of the internal world. The rules of both are different. We learn to do both, nivritti as well as pravritti. So, any questions? So far, all clear? I just wanted to ask something. Yeah, Ashish, go ahead. 
Uh, so sleep cycle is also the same duration, I think, roughly, isn't it? Uh, same as what? Uh, the breathing cycle, the change of breath. Um, that depends. Uh, the initial phases are different. You have a longer dreaming and deep sleep cycle. And through the night, the cycles get smaller. So not necessary that they are the same as the breathing cycle. Okay, I thought they were like roughly 90 minutes each. So mm. maybe that's not the case. No, that's not the case. As I said, when you sleep at night in the early three to four hours already, your most uh, dreaming time has been covered. Dreaming and rest, deep sleep. Okay. After yeah. that, there are many smaller cycles. In, during that time, the dreaming and the deep sleep cycles get smaller and smaller until morning around 5 or 6, you know, assuming you're sleeping at a decent hour around 10 o'clock, then about 6 or 7 hours later, the cycles have got so short that, you know, you wake up. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was just wondering whether there's a relationship between the two in the sleeping cycle and the breathing cycle, but yeah. No, not, not that. This yeah, not that I'm aware of, no. I mean, of course, everything is connected, but not yeah. in the way you are uh, implying. Okay. okay. Gautam says since Pravriti Marg is inner to outer, how is it practiced if inner isn't realized? Yes, Gautam, when you have a teacher and you are initiated into that practice, you will know it. It's unfortunately not a question that I can answer um, right now. So um, the answer takes years to uh, unfold. Okay. Yohim, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to just come back to the circle chart and uh, uh, what happens then actually to prana when we die? Because we are experiencing or we try when we do pranayama, the real pranayama, hmm. we try to experience prana. Hmm. So, so when we die, obviously when you look at the circle chart, then hmm. it is part of the immortal, the adi prana is part of the immortal self. Partially um, immortal self also, yeah. It's it's uh, this is the connection, yeah. Prana is the connection. Yeah. Now when we die, it's still there. Because when yeah. we die, the senses, the body, the breath, and the conscious mind drops away, and what is left is the jivatmaman, and the jivatman, the vehicle, is active, latent, joined to the immortal self. So ati prana keeps it together. It's the link. Yeah, yeah. That actually, it just made me aware that how fine this substance must be when it's even there when we are dead, mm -hmm. and we are still able to connect to it when we are alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We are able to do that. Yes, if we practice correctly, it uh, requires a great deal of depth of understanding and practice as well. Far too many people are talking very superficially. And, uh, you know, I would say almost in a very trivializing the um, science of Kundalini. It's a very, very profound, deep science. And it has been trivialized with, you know, every little yoga center at the street corner uh, talking about Kundalini seminars and things like this have been trivialized it completely makes it um, sound like almost anybody can do this. It's not true. It requires a great deal of um, subtle understanding and depth in practice. Okay. So okay. we can continue. Pages. So we see that the body, breath, mind, prana, the cosmos itself are a part of a continuum. The universe around us is all flowing with prana. 
It's all consciousness. So when we begin to understand this, we realize we are one with the universe. Aham Brahmasmi. When we get this depth of insight, we understand that. So what is the principle of pranayam practice? The basic principle is to move from the gross to the subtle, from the external to the internal, and from movement to stillness. In previous sessions, I have mentioned both these examples. These are very important examples. One is of the caterpillar. When it moves from one leaf to the next, it doesn't jump from one to the other. There's a period of transition. At some point of time, it's on both. It's on the first leaf as well as the second leaf. And through our breathing exercises that I've explained in the previous sessions, we have seen how we go from the breath, which is pretty much at the physical level, slowly to the mind and slowly to something even more subtle, the mantra, which is at the level of the mind. And it's taking you to subtle depths of consciousness and to prana. The same idea is used in the example of looking for the polar star. It's very hard to find and locate the polar star itself. So first you look for the plough or the great bear. In India, in, they're also known as the Saptarishi, the seven sages. And when you find the great bear or the plough, which is quite easy to spot, then you can locate the very fine polar star, which is always constant. So if you want to find that which is permanent, which is constant, the subtle, you first need to go from the gross to the subtle to the subtle most. So we see that pranayam is not just about breathing exercises. These are very, very gross. Pranayam is learning to move to that subtle aspect and then coming to that stillness from movement to stillness. So in pranayam itself, in what I say, inverted commas, real pranayam, we're not talking about breathing exercises. We are talking about using the mind and opening the sushumna and then also learning to go to the level of prana itself. So pranayama, which is translated as control of prana. Prana and ama is control. We've talked about control not being a very good word to use here as well. Implies somehow that you're supposed to do something. Stop breathing, don't, you know, uh, um, sustain your breath for a longer time. These are the common understandings. But ayama, it means mastery, having mastery over prana itself. As I said, very advanced stage when you are able to see the prana in your body, the flow, and that is exactly how the sages were able to map out the energy channels because they were able to go to that level itself. So breath, if we were to go back to our earlier diagram, was manifestation at the level of the body. But prana is far deeper and it is basically consciousness itself, energy itself, life itself.
In Yoga Sutras, one talks about the fourth pranayama. So what are the first three pranayams which are mentioned in the Yoga Sutras? The first one we say is, that's how it has been explained in the Yoga Sutras, inhalation. Second one is exhalation. Third one is umbak, holding the breath. And then we have the fourth pranayam, which is prana itself. In the Yoga Sutras, it's explained. Inhalation, exhalation, I don't think that requires explanation. Kumbhak or retention, we will go into that when we discuss in further detail what um, the fourth pranayam is, what kumbhak is. We shall go into detail there. But what is the fourth pranayam itself? That is prana. And that is what the Yoga Sutra tells us. Basically, everything is prana. Okay. So, any questions about that so far? some reason my screen is frozen not able to scroll up or down you know it's not very nice don't know why that's happening maybe I just stop and start again hmm okay suddenly I have a pointer but my free screen is frozen. Hmm, that's not very good. Well, okay. Trying to make do with that. This happens, this feeling of the fourth prana. When you are established and you can attain mastery in these subtle realms, you have learned to open Sushumna, you're exploring the inner here you have started exploring the active and the latent unconscious mind you're so deep now in it that you're right here and what has happened to the breath you have left the breath behind completely so people ask well if you leave the breath behind completely, how can you live? If you stop breathing, the breath has become so fine, so subtle. For an external viewer, you're not breathing. And indeed, if that happens, that you do stop breathing at some point. You have attained the breathless state, samadhi. Why is it that you still live? Why don't you die? Because you are here. You are somewhere here, which is prana itself. It's life itself. Can a fish drown in water? No. Fish cannot drown in water. That's the element in which it is, uh, which is life itself for the fish. Right. So, indeed, you cannot drown <clears throat> in prana. That's the element of life itself. So when you are there, you do not drown. <clears throat> you do not die. Okay. So any more questions about that?
So this is very odd because my screen is frozen and I can't do very much other than shift from one thing to another. But that also doesn't quite work. I think I need to kind of click away these things maybe and then maybe that works. So let me try. No, I can't click that away either. Hmm. <laughs> not very nice. Close the browser and reopen it, but then I'll have to restart the meeting. You know, yeah. Could you share with somebody else's screen and uh, do the same page on somebody else's screen? Yeah. Joachim, um, could you do that? Um, just go to the... Thanks, for Scott. Uh, that was a good idea. I can perhaps... Uh, you can, you can yeah. do screen sharing. I need to... <clears throat> you need to go to... Uh, the website essential practices and go to uh, Sandhya. Yeah, okay. Okay, now I could Okay, so I did it. Can you see? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. That's that's right. Good. So that's um that was a brilliant idea, Scott. Thank you. Sure. So when we have this state of Sandhya, we are experiencing this calmness and it seems that the dualities have vanished. And it's in this moment that we can go through and if fortunate we can also go right to the very depth and attain the highest state of Samadhi. What happens very often, however, is that ancient samskaras come up and disturb us, pull us down again, pull us out again. So, of course, it is therefore important to do that purification. The first process that I explained where if we use pranayam and go directly right through is a method of meditation, we call that a method of contraction. You sort of ignore everything. You're concentrated, focused only on your object of concentration. You go right, straight down to Samadhi. But in practice, what happens is some scars come up and disturb us. We get pulled into these. We're not able to maintain our detached state, the state of non-detachment, Vairagya. So, we come out of that. That's why we need to purify to a certain extent the samskaras that we have. We're learning to let go by uncoloring these samskaras so that when they do come up, they should not really disturb us. And we can continue to cross, go through the active and the unconscious mind to the other side. And that process is known as the part of part of expansion. So in theory, people think they have to choose this or that, but what happens in practice is you need to do both. Initially, it's better to do the path of expansion. It's easier, it's sustainable, and then the coloring has decreased, the samskaras are not so strong, then you can do the path, path of contraction, which is using the pranayam methods to attain samadhi. So going straight to the fourth, samadhi, fourth, 
form of pranayam and attaining. So we say this stage when Sushumna is open is known as Sandhya, when the sun and the moon meet, the wedding of the sun and the moon, when day meets night and night meets day. So Sandhya is a simple technique to open both nostrils so that both the breath flow freely. It's also the meditation state where you are aware of the breath at that point between both the nostrils. You allow these thoughts to rise and fall away. It is also that mystical threshold to the unconscious mind, the state of the unconscious mind where you begin to gain access to the immense possibilities of the mind and learn Sandhya Bhasha, the twilight language spoken only by the yogis. Is it a real language? No. It's not a real language in the sense of English, Hindi, German or any other language. It is the way yogis communicate with each other. Those who have had the experience, they communicate in that language. So when people ask me questions based on book knowledge, I know it's based on book knowledge because had it been based on experience, they would explain and ask different questions. So it's very clear to one who has experienced Sandhya and gone a bit deeper, who has experienced it and who hasn't. Uh, Matthias, maybe I misuse, but it's also not another name for Sanskrit, the twilight language? No, that's not another name for Sanskrit. No. Sanskrit is also known as the language of the gods and um, I don't know <laughs> what other name it should have. Devanagari perhaps the, the script is called for the is called Devanagari. But Sandhya Bhasha is not a twilight language, it's not another name for Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a normal language, just like Hindi, English, German, and all the many, many languages that we use to communicate with each other in this plane of consciousness. Sandhya Bhasha is one who has had these deep, mystical, subtle experiences, and they begin to understand how the world is built, how it is built up, how it is sort of the building blocks of the world. And because they understand how the world is created, they can also dismantle it. They can go beyond it. They gain that mastery to go beyond this world whenever they want, if they want. They may decide to stay here for longer to fulfill their own, perhaps, desires in a different way because they're enjoying this world or to serve others. It is not a regular language. You're an adept. You have gained certain mastery. It doesn't mean you're done. You have not attained moksha yet, because if you still have a body, you have not attained that. As I said, maybe they don't want to as yet. It's a matter of choice. Once they know how the world is built up, like the building blocks, many of us played with building blocks when we were children. Lego, you know, Lego building blocks or any other building blocks, and you created something 
and you could also take it apart and you could recreate something else. Imagine you can create worlds and that is the kind of mastery we are talking. That is one who gains mastery in the external and the internal worlds, in both. Shibu, I don't know what this has to do with the Tamil Siddha Yogis. Maybe they mention it. This is not about Tamil or North Indian or Christian yogis or, or any other. All mystics throughout the world, it doesn't matter, irrespective of religion, irrespective of which part of the world they come from, they speak that language when they attain that summit. Mystics or masters at that level do not identify anymore with a religion or a region or a race or a, or, um, or a certain people or a gender. They go beyond all these petty identifications. And then the final aspect of Sandhya is that transition where all the mysteries of life and death are revealed as a transition to the other shore. Such a master learns to give up his body or her body consciously Can you scroll down, Joachim? I think now my screen is frozen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's... So, so, so. Let me just try, just try. Yeah. I, have my, I have mine on the same page, if you want to try mine. Yeah, you can do that, you just give Joachim a... a I don't know, if some, something seems to be wrong today with, with the go-to-meeting. Platform. Can you see my screen? Uh, now it works again. Oh, it works. Yeah. Okay, good. good. <laughs> yeah, I think it has to do with a, it has to do with the pointer. Thanks, Scott. Yes, it has something to do with the pointer because when I turned on the pointer, my screen froze. Yeah. Yeah. So I just switched it off, and now I can yeah. scroll down. Yes. So um, yes, that's where we were. So, Sandhya leads to this meditative state and sometimes a lot of students, when they're given this practice, they say, well, this is too simple, I know it. <laughs> I hear this very often, oh yeah, I already know this, I have done it before. Well, it's about depth. It's not about having done it, you know, it's not something you say, I did it and check, you know. It's about going deeper into it. And it has happened very often. Some of us who have been here longer and are doing this, they describe this to me and they say, yeah, I was doing this. And then suddenly I just got up and, and left. What happened? They were doing this practice and as they started getting a little deeper, they were not able to sustain the energy. It's something very, very simple breath observation, but still we are not able to sustain that energy. That point is also known as Sukhamana. It comes from Sushumna and becomes Sukhamana. That's where Sushumna comes from. Sushumna is coming from Sukhamana. Sukha is happy mind. Mana is mind. So happy mind is Sushumna. It's also known as Sushumna awakening or breath awareness. And the teacher often asks his student, the ones who are initiated into this practice, have you done your Sandhya? No, we don't miss the Sandhya. Have you done your Sandhya? Sandhya is also what the Brahmins call their ritual. That ritual is done always at these transition times. It's done in the morning, at dawn, it is done at midday and in the evening. 
So this is the time when the yogis also practice, but they don't do a ritualistic practice. They do the yogic practice because they don't want to just do a chanting of a few mantras and call this a shumna or call that sandhya. They want to experience the sandhya directly. The meeting, the wedding, the wedding of the sun and the moon. It is one of the most mystical practices of our tradition and it actually leads to sandhya, which is the threshold to the deeper states of consciousness. And then one travels naturally. You don't have to put so much effort. That's what it means to flow with the natural cycles. Very often some of the students write to me and say, Oh, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Sometimes I am doing so well and at other times I'm stuck. The mind goes up and down. That's the nature of the mind. And I often give this example of the tides which flow, you know. High tide and low tide. If you are a windsurfer, if you are enjoying that, you, I'm sure that almost none of you are surfing, <laughs> but you have definitely seen somewhere uh, how it is. It's very, a very difficult sport and you know what they do. When there is no wave, they paddle, paddle, paddle. It's very um, exhausting. You know? They have to lie on the board and they use their hands to paddle they paddle into the sea and when they see a wave coming, they jump onto the board and then they ride the wave. It's very beautiful. Then you ride the wave. And that's what I say. Go with the cycles. It should be natural and effortless. If it is exhausting, if it is strenuous, you're continuously fighting your own nature. Instead, learn to find that balance. Find that flow in you. Flow of the tide in you. And then go with that tide. The more you struggle against yourself, the more you try to fight that tide. Imagine you would try to paddle when there is a wave. Or try to ride a non-existent wave, that wouldn't work at all, would it? And that's unfortunately what many of us are trying to do. We're going against the cycle, which is natural. So if you find that flow, go with the flow. If you're stuck, doesn't mean nothing is happening. If you're so-called stuck, it means you're integrating things. It means you need to wait. One cannot always, in our tradition, we also say we don't practice or have some higher practices that we give, some more intense practices that we give. We don't give them all the time. If you're given a practice, then you have a time where you can integrate that practice. And in this way, you use the cycles of nature. Okay, um, Joachim, can you scroll up further? Yes, and that's the breath cycle in the brain and the nervous system. We already spoke about it. Right, and the dualities. We, we mentioned that as well. A nice little thing which comes from the Indian tradition is the chickpea. <laughs> Not many people know this, but the chickpea or chana as it call, it's called in India is a symbol of the non-dual reality. It's basically the same symbol as the Tao, the Chinese symbol of yin and yang. They're put together, there's the masculine, the feminine, and they're sort of put together in a case. That's what the Chana is. If you see, there, it's a, in two halves. It's, there's a right and a left, and it's together in this, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, husk. And it's... Um, encased 
It almost looks like the human brain, you know, the right brain and the left brain. It's a symbol of non-dual duality, the union of, of the male and the female, the right and left, the dualities. So, we will not do um, Sushumna application at, in this uh, session. We will do it in the next session because um, we will not have time for it. In the next session, we will actually do uh, Sushumna breath or Sushumna Kriya and then the Sandhya, the technique, and learning how to use that technique. So, that's what we're going to do in our next session. Any questions so far? Okay, all Just good. One. Yeah. Um, so, is it possible sometimes we experience things and we just don't realize it? Like you're talking about the wedding, um, you're talking about you know, entering that Sanjay state. Mm -hmm. Sometimes quite possible that we are experiencing that but just not really aware of it. Oh yes, of course. That's, uh, thank you for mentioning that, Scott. Um, we have these mini samadhis uh, quite frequently. As you know, if the cycle is shifting about every 90 minutes or every 120 minutes, at this time, you are naturally in this transition. If you are aware and you can sort of hold on to it for a little bit, you feel a sense of utter ease. You feel completely relaxed, at peace with the world, connected, you know, not separated, not isolated, content. You can imagine when you go out, perhaps in nature, beautiful walk in the woods, you walk on a moon, a full moon night, in the moonlight, with your partner. It's quiet, it's peaceful. And in that moment, you just might experience that state of being connected. You see a starlit sky and you just feel like a part of the universe. A sense of awe, sense of connection. These are those moments of transition. You may not be aware of it, but these are the many samadhis that we experience. And we can experience this many times in nature. I often say nature heals. Why does nature heal? Nature heals because in nature we experience a sense of awe, a sense of connection, and the mind seems to balance naturally on its own. You come to that state of sandhya just purely without even doing anything, without any effort. And if that experience is really, really strong, you can, within a few moments, experience such a depth of that samadhi experience of, of being one with the universe. And that experience of aham brahmasmi, that this can really completely change your life forever. And maybe that increases the longing for a systematic method. You might discover that you keep going for walks at the same time, but then you don't experience that, that, that magical moment happening. And you want to relive it. You want to go back there to that, that beautiful feeling of oneness. And if you don't have it, that longing increases, the desire grows. And that is what brings you to that point where you say, okay, I need a teacher. I need somebody who will, who will, will explain me this process in a systematic manner. How do I go about it? That I can do this at will, on command, on demand, <laughs> and 
That's the difference between a mystic and a yogi. A mystic, by force of his samskaras through his spiritual evolution, has attained this naturally. He knows how to flow with the tides of inhalation and exhalation. These are the twin laws of the world. Inhalation and exhalation, the breath. These are the tides of life. And they have learned to do that. How do you do this? In a systematic manner. So you don't have to wait all the time. And that's the practice of yoga. Okay. Good. So I hope you enjoyed. And we Thank you. Most welcome everybody. So enjoy the rest of your weekend and we catch up on Friday again for Bhagavad Gita. Bye bye everybody. Bye. Thanks again, Scott. Bye. That was brilliant, Scott. Thanks. <laughs> Most welcome, Yogi. Have a nice day in Oklahoma. <laughs> yes, you too. See ya. See ya. See ya.